When you think about piracy, or anti-piracy measures in games, you probably think about PC gaming, the Nintendo DS, or Game Boy Advance, or maybe even the Dreamcast or PlayStation. But one console that probably doesn't come to mind is the Nintendo 64. Due to the system using cartridges, pirated copies were more expensive to reproduce. This meant that pirates in the late 90s and early 2000s instead set their sights on the Dreamcast and PS1, as discs were a lot cheaper to reproduce. With that said, it wasn't as if developers just left their N64 games without any form of copy protection. Many N64 titles actually have anti-piracy, including titles like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and several titles made by Rare, such as Donkey Kong 64. So in this video, we'll be showing you some of the most noteworthy examples of anti-piracy measures in Nintendo 64 games, starting with the much-loved platformer collectathon Banjo-Tooie. Rare knew that Banjo-Kazooie was a hit with the Nintendo 64, and they wanted to make sure its sequel sold just as well, by introducing new anti-piracy measures. But we're sure the team didn't expect their efforts to be so effective that Tui is often touted as the most copy-protected N64 title in the entire system's library. In fact, the ROM for Banjo-Tooie wasn't entirely cracked until December 2012, over 12 years after its release. Although Tooie could be played relatively issue-free on Nintendo 64 emulators on PC, prior to December 2012, the game wouldn't work properly on flash cuts like the EverDrive. This is partly a result of the emulators being able to emulate boot chips and the like, but it's also due to the game having many anti-piracy checks. The first test occurs when the game is powered on, where it checks for the correct save type. Banjo-Tooie uses a 2KB EEPROM, but if the save type for the game is incorrect, or there simply is no save chip present on the game's cartridge, the game acts as if there's no controller plugged in. This means no buttons will respond, and a no controller message will display on screen. The second level of copy protection comes in the form of a CIC lockout chip which the game checks for, with NTSC copies of the game checking to see if a CIC NUS 6 105 chip is present, and PAL copies looking out for a CIC NUS 7105 chip. This check is done by using the challenge response feature found in these chips, which Banjo-Tooie makes heavy use of throughout gameplay, with 268 different checks in total. The responses from the CIC chip are used to decrypt files associated with the game's assets, so if any of these checks end up failing, the game can't decrypt the data, and will be unable to load a required asset into the game. This results in all manner of crashes, and since this happens hundreds of times throughout the game, it's essentially unplayable. If you're not familiar with Nintendo 64 anti-piracy, and who'd blame you, you might be asking yourself, what the hell are these CIC chips the game uses? Well, it's a fascinating series of chips that many N64 games use for copy protection, including several more games in this video. So, we're going to briefly explain how it works. But just before we move on, a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Manscaped.com. We've talked about Manscaped before and can genuinely say that Manscaped makes excellent products. Their performance package kit is the world's first all-in-one men's grooming kit that makes trimming the hedges efficient and easy. And Manscaped just revealed a new in-shower solution designed specifically for men that takes this kit even further. The new Ultra Premium Body Wash. This is a daily shower gel scented with Manscaped refined cologne. It's infused with aloe vera and sea salt for a perfect balance of tough cleaning, and soothing hydration that's both subtle and masculine with lasting results. The 16-ounce aluminium bottle dispenses the perfect amount of body wash needed for full body coverage, and it's paraben-free, cruelty-free, and vegan, so there's no harmful dyes or chemicals. And after you've rinsed off, you can grab your Manscaped Lawn Mower 4.0 waterproof body trimmer and go to town on skin that's soft and properly prepped for a trim. So join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped to give them the right tools for their family jewels, and get 20% off your Manscaped order, plus free international shipping when you use promo code DYKG20 at manscaped.com. And now back to explaining those CIC chips. CICs are boot chips. And ever since the NES and SNES, Nintendo had implemented CICs in their systems to curb piracy. However, it wasn't long before pirates worked out a means of circumventing the anti-piracy measures that utilized these chips, and so it became open for the masses to play downloaded ROMs. For the N64, Nintendo didn't stray too far from the measures they already knew, and continued to utilize CIC chips. 
However, Nintendo knew that these were simple to bypass, so a change in implementation was made. Instead of the N64 including a corresponding CIC chip, it instead used a PIF bus. This handled the system's initial boot code for the system, as well as handling controller inputs, but mostly it handles security on the console. It checks that a cartridge contains the correct CIC chip, thus checking if it's been pirated, and that it's a cartridge with the same region as the console. With the SNES, it became simple enough to disable the circuit which the CIC in both the cartridges and the system utilized, but the N64 now had a chip which handled multiple functions and didn't work in sync with the chip on the cartridge. This means that stopping the circuit the chip is running on would just result in games failing to boot entirely. This meant that N64 devices which ran backups would often require the use of a legitimate cartridge as well, in order to use the CIC chip located on the legitimate game. In total, there were five different CIC chips on cartridges per region, which meant that you'd need to use a game which utilized the correct chip for the game you wanted to run. This was a problem for people wanting to play Star Fox 64 for example, as it was the only game to use the CIC NUS 6101 chip on the cartridge, which meant you'd need a legitimate copy of Star Fox 64 in order to play a backup copy. Over time, many clever people worked out the deeper inner workings of both the CIC and the PIF, and ultimately came up with a means to get around their methods. We mentioned before that Banjo-Tooie had stringent copy protection, but this was typical of Rare, who would aggressively protect their games from piracy. While most companies simply put faith into Nintendo's built-in anti-piracy measures, Rare implemented additional security in most of their games, and Jet Force Gemini was one of these titles. If the game detected a different variant of the CIC chip than what is supposed to be included in the game, it would still boot, but during the game, all weapons would be disabled. If the player tried pressing the Z button to fire, they'll simply hold their weapon out and do nothing, meaning that it would be impossible to progress past the first line for store in Goldwood. Additionally, if the player is controlling Juno, they'll no longer be able to run and be forced to move through the world at an incredibly slow walk speed. Most N64 backup devices used the 6102 and 7102 variants of the CIC chip, because this was the most common CIC in N64 carts. But Jet Force Gemini used 6105 and 7105 variants, which made the game difficult to pirate successfully. This was more strict than Rare's earlier anti-piracy measures, but the methods used in earlier titles such as Diddy Kong Racing could still leave would-be pirates a little vexed. Diddy Kong Racing makes the typical checks for the correct CIC chip, but interestingly, if it finds a chip of a different iteration, the game will actually let the player progress to a race with a catch. From there, they'll be subjected to the pause menu continuously appearing to disrupt gameplay. We say this is less strict because, technically, this does mean that the player could complete the game if they continuously unpaused it, but this would probably be excruciating to endure, or perhaps a great speedrun category to watch on games done quick. Donkey Kong 64 was similarly not quite as harsh at preventing the player from making progress, but it wasn't exactly forgiving of pirates. If a different CIC chip than the one included in the retail cart is being used, the game will boot and play completely fine. The only problem is the player would have to be willing to leave their system on even when they're not playing, as the game will randomly delete save data from the cartridge during gameplay without warning. But these examples are fairly simple, deleting save data, stopping the game from booting, or preventing progress. What about some whacked out nonsense that makes pirates confused and flustered? Perfect Dark contains a huge number of piracy checks in its data, with some being pretty simple and some being pretty bizarre. All of the game's anti-piracy measures occur when specific actions are taken in-game, and if one of the checks fails to determine the title is running unmodified and legitimately, they will trigger. The first check occurs during the power-on phase, causing the game to simply never boot. Another check is made when opening the game's cheat menu, which will simply crash the game. When opening a door, the game will rewrite its code to prevent doors from opening. 
If a simulant picks up an item in multiplayer, all guards will suddenly be able to see the player through walls. And when a guard uncloaks, this disables the ability for the player, and other characters, from going up and down slopes. Another fun form of copy protection happens whenever a character throws a grenade, which will trigger an infinite number of explosions to spawn around the player. And not just that, but whenever there is an explosion, the game will then make all explosions massive. And if a player breaks glass, the game's audio frequency is modified to an incredibly high value, resulting in all characters sounding like chipmunks. Rare certainly got creative with this one, but Nintendo have also gotten a bit wild with their anti-piracy measures themselves. One of the biggest titles on the Nintendo 64, and the one most likely to be the shining jewel in a would-be pirate's sights, is The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Just like every other game we've mentioned, Zelda utilizes a check for the correct CIC lockout chip. And if a chip other than 6105 or 7105 is detected, several measures are put in place. One alteration is made with how the code manages the fishing minigame. This measure makes it so that fish from the pond at Lake Hylia always let go after being caught for 51 frames, about two and a half seconds, making the fishing minigame impossible. This in particular seems like a strange piece of anti-piracy, as the fishing segment isn't needed to beat the game, and is only needed if you want to 100% complete it. That said, a different measure will absolutely stop you in your tracks. If you're playing a pirated game, the bars found in Ganon's castle which block the exits during the escape sequence might give you some trouble. Zelda will normally open these bars for the player, but if the wrong chip is detected, the bars will simply stay in place. Zelda, however, will not. But probably the most bizarre change to occur involves the 3D model for adult Zelda during cutscenes. This can first be seen during the cutscene in which Sheik's identity is revealed, where Sheik transforms back into Zelda to reveal her with a rather extreme slick back puff hairstyle. Did you also know that one Game Boy game actually lets you change the channel on your TV? Or that the English localizer for several Pokemon games secretly snuck in a few references to memes? For more facts, check out our videos on Game Boy games and memes in games. Normally at this point, I would ask a question uh, about something, but this video doesn't really lend itself to a question, so um... I just want some honest feedback about the, the channel. I just want some honest feedback about me and Greg. I just want to know what you guys think. How do you think the channel's going? Are you enjoying yourself? Is the content all good? Just let us know. We always appreciate feedback, and I feel like we've not really had much lately. 